Hello, and welcome to Linux Action News, episode 235, recorded on April 5th, 2022. I'm Chris. And I'm Wes. Hello, Wes. Let's do the news. And we start with some good news, everyone. At least for the Docker fans out there. But for those of you on the Docker Inc. Death Watch instead, well, it seems you'll just have to wait a little bit longer. The embattled containerization company this week announced a $105 million Series C funding round, led by Bain Capital Ventures. That brings its total funding to $163 million and a company valuation of $2.1 billion. These valuations still make no sense. That's, that's 2.3 Linodes. <laughs> that's what they're saying Docker is worth. And yet, uh, you're not kidding, Wes. Analysts have been circling like vultures over Docker, expecting them any day to announce the collapse of the commercial structure around Docker. And here, the folks at Bain Capital are willing to sink a whole bunch of more money into it. But, you know, doesn't mean that page after page of clickbait won't still be written about Docker's limited days ahead. And there is some credibility to it. We have indeed seen major restructures at the Docker company. We absolutely have seen some flipping between various product focuses, trying to find some traction in the market somewhere where they can make money. But when you read between the lines, it really seems like the investors are more hyped about the software market's overall growth potential than they are necessarily about Docker, except for the fact that Docker Inc. is just seen as one of the companies that is selling the shovels to this next wave of software developers they see coming. For the company's part in the announcement for this latest round of funding, Docker's CEO said, quote, Together, we have focused on the needs of developers. To help them quickly and safely build, share, and run any app anywhere. As tens of millions of new developers join the market this decade, this funding enables us to go faster in solving problems for the next generation. Hmm. Docker also said it has about more than 56,000 commercial customers. But overall, Docker didn't really go into specifics about how this new investment money will be used. In fact, when you read through their announcement, one kind of gets the impression that maybe this investment money is going to just simply cover the bills and keep the lights on. Meanwhile, the folks behind the LexD project have been hard at work on the latest stable release of their system container and virtual machine manager. Yeah, this is often an overlooked tool, but it really has grown just a robust set of features and a really nice, dependable, stable support lifecycle. Yeah, I think that's highlighted in their release announcement where they say, quote, this is our fourth LTS release and quite an exciting one for anyone coming from LexD 4.0 as it significantly steps up LexD's abilities especially when operating in a clustered environment. As with all our other LTS releases, this one will be supported for five years until June 2027 and will receive a number of bug fix and security point releases over that time. Lexi is really known for an impressive backwards compatibility story, but things do change over time and it seems they're making some adjustments. They write in the release, this just became increasingly costly, the amount of code we had to keep around to handle data migration. This was also causing us to keep depending on old dependencies that have gone unmaintained for years and becoming a potential security risk. As a result, LexD 5.0 was changed to only support upgrading from LexD 4.0 or higher. But boy, is it worth an upgrade because a lot has happened since that last LTS, including an Definitely not least, virtual machine support is effectively at feature parity with containers now. That includes stuff like virtual TPM support, arbitrary PCI device pass-through, and even live migration and stateful snapshots. Arbitrary PCI device and live migration support, that looks awesome. If you want to give it a go, they've got released hardballs as well as packages in Snapcraft, Brew, and for Windows as well. Now, for a change that the open source community is getting a front row seat to. That's the overhaul of Fedora's installer, which ultimately means the overhaul of the Red Hat Enterprise Linux installer as well. Indeed, we covered this originally in January when we said, hey, this is in the works. And it seems that the team has been reviewing the feedback since then. 
and has also been running usability studies over the last few years, and they're bringing it all together in a design review process. It seems that uh, some of the feedback indicated their current hub-and-spoke design was a bit confusing. They note that users were having some difficulty understanding the selection options on the hub screen and also determining which spoke steps to take to complete the installation. Yeah, I think you'd probably agree with that, Wes. Oh, yeah, uh, definitely. (laughs) It seems that their new approach is more of an install wizard look, uh, something that users are probably going to be a little bit more familiar with. And in a community blog post, they note that the advantages of this new approach are, quote, it supports a guided step-by-step workflow that allows users to focus on discrete tasks. A wizard helps break down otherwise complex tasks into a series of small, simple steps. Now, it is still early days here, but uh, this is pretty encouraging to see. You know, I've never been a huge fan of the current version of Anaconda, but I I have to admit there's a lot of good bones there. There's a lot of good pieces that they have, especially some of that, you know, like the new updated disk partitioning tool that they've built and obviously just a lot of the low-level pieces. So it's, it's kind of refreshing seeing the team being willing to take this criticism, look at other ideas, and also be really transparent about the whole thing. While we're talking about Fedora, the team is brainstorming a possible GUI-based Linux recovery environment. Yeah, Michael Larble over at Pharonix flagged this one, and it sure seems like it could be a nice complement to Fedora's existing command-line-based recovery environment. We should note, though, that uh, currently this is in the would-be-nice-to-have stage, but it does seem like there is some genuine planning happening behind the scenes. Wouldn't this be great to see? Because you start layering tools on like this, right? You maybe create a tool that can help fix an unbootable system, or maybe it even has the ability to browse and select previous snapshots, while also the team is building tools on top of ButterFS and integrating DNF snapshot support. We've got flat packs that are delivering applications, and the underlying system upgrades have been getting better and better. So you start seeing like all of this layer together, and what you get is like this next level of reliability. A real kind of bulletproof reliability that's, that's just an unbeatable feature in enterprise desktops. Everyone's favorite open source firmware update tool, FluppD, has a new release this week. Most notable this time around is support for some Logitech mice and keyboards, Wacom panels on Lenovo laptops, and some additional support for fingerprint readers. Lutris, the long-running open-source game manager that I personally love and works across various stores and platforms, has released version 0.5.10 this week. And what's notable is this version features initial Steam Deck support. That Steam Deck support is partially thanks to their collaboration with Valve after receiving a Steam Deck development kit. Now, Lutris's Flatpak version, that's still being worked on right now as the next step in better Steam Deck support. Until that's fully baked, installing Lutris on the deck actually requires putting the root file system in read-write mode, at least for getting things installed initially. That's that's a little unfortunate. Um, You can understand uh, something like Lutris, it, it needs access to all kinds of things on your system for just a wide variety of types of games and hardware that it supports. But in turn, that means that this could be at risk of the install getting wiped out during the next SteamOS update because of the read-only nature of the SteamOS system. But we'll have more on that in a moment, because I think what I wanted to mention it struck me about this is we have talked about this, the deck's ability to run, you know, even competitor software and competing app stores and whatnot, just the ability to run applications. But here we are seeing it in the real world, and it's still just so novel and rare that a hardware device like this will support running something like Lutris or another installer that, you know, maybe Valve isn't even a big fan of internally. And I, I don't know if this is ever going to materialize into some use case that we never saw, but now the deck is super popular for. But I would just be thrilled if even some of the sales here were attributed to the fact that people knew they could buy the deck and install whatever emulator they, they wanted to play their favorite Nintendo game or their favorite retro game. If this just became known as the device that lets you play anything on the go, and because of its open nature it got there, I think you could see a new trend being set in the industry. I know that's pie in the sky, but 
I, I think you see the early framework being laid right here for that. And here I thought you were just getting excited about running MS Access via Wine on the go. <laughs> that too, of course. Now, as far as gaming features go, 0510 also adds support for integration with games installed via Origin and Ubisoft Connect. There's also a new UI window for adding games directly to Lutris, amongst a variety of other improvements. Linode.com slash LAN. Go there to get $100 in 60-day credit on a new account, and you go there to support this here show. Linode is definitely the Linux geeks cloud. They've got 11 data centers worldwide, and they've been hard at work in making Linode the best experience for 19 years. And they started with a passion for Linux. And this week I've had a whole new appreciation for getting a passion around databases, just critical to the applications we run. And now I get it. Now I see why Linode has been rolling out hosted MySQL services. I got to say I'm super tempted. It's just, it's nice to have the experience, the performance, and the reliability of Linode. You know, I mean, I could sit here and tell you too, it's like they're great support. It's really all of those things. They just are fantastic. And they're always rolling out new features and getting better than ever. So go grab $100 in credit and try it out for yourself. See why we like it so much. From the best customer support, super fast networking, and a Linux culture that runs deep, there's a lot of great reasons to choose Linode. So put it over the top, linode.com slash LAN. Support the show and get $100 in credit. Linux.ting.com. Are you sick of overpaying for your cell service? I know I was, so go see how much you could save and then take $25 off of that. Linux.ting.com. They're a mobile virtual network operator. So they're focusing on the customer relationship, the value, the great plans, not digging the holes, not lining the pockets of the regulators. None of that stuff the duopolies have to do, but they get access to the big nationwide networks and they have great customer service. In fact, Ting was just recently named the number one carrier by Consumer Reports in 2021. And their plans are simple and straightforward. It's one of the reasons why I've been a customer since 2013. And indeed, their customer support has come through when I have needed it. And I love the fact there's no contracts. So for some reason, it actually makes me want to stick around more. And it's simple to switch to Ting. Just about any phone's going to work. So go try it. Linux.ting.com. Mobile's never been simpler. It's how it should be. Linux.ting.com. With the release of Lutris 0510 and the release of the Steam Deck in general, a debate seems to be brewing in the community. One that goes to the core of the Linux user experience and asks the fundamental question, who are we building the desktop for? This was all kind of sparked by the developer of Lutris himself, Matthew Commandon. In a tweet, he said, quote, we got to stop this culture of only install flat packs. Using root is dangerous before it extends beyond the Steam Deck. Last thing I want is for desktop Linux to become like Android or Chrome OS. Yeah, and then later on he continued on flat pack, apps don't have permission to access your stuff. It renders them much less useful than native ones. I have a command to run to give all flat packs permissions to the whole file system to circumvent this issue. Um, I'll add this. I think, you know, Matthew joined us in Linux Unplugged episode 399. And I still reflect back on that conversation pretty frequently. And I believe from what I know of Matthew, he has users' best interest in mind here. He doesn't want to take away power just in the name of making things easier or safer. I, he's probably amongst the crowd that really believes there's a way to strike the balance here. And I, I, think that's a, I think that's actually a pretty reasonable position. But i got to say the reaction from the community was a lot stronger than I expected. Yeah, there have been more than a few hot takes in the last couple days. It kind of seems like we're getting back to something of a classic debate, though. You know, the free software community has limited time and limited resources, and we have to choose how we spend them. Do we build things for expert users, for ourselves, for the users who are here and passionate and, and know how to get things going themselves, who can already put up with the state of desktop Linux? Or do we spend that time building for what we hope is the next million users, you know, folks who have different requirements and who might need a little more help? Yeah, that's probably it. It's not really a flat pack or snaps or universal apps or bad debate. I mean, that might be the context right now. 
But it's it's really a debate about making desktop Linux more or less like Chrome OS or Android. And I think the thing that's new here is the deck is an irritant to this debate. It's forcing our community to take a look at this issue again in a new way. Yeah, once again, we walk down this path of, oh, gosh, look, it's Linux. It's it's trying to be deployed desktop Linux out in the field. But yeah, with, like with Android, like with Chrome OS, it also kind of makes us a little uncomfortable because it's, well, it's not how we would do it. It's not how we would build the systems we'd make for ourselves. There's also, of course, sort of the uh, tertiary discussion around just security on the desktop in general. We've seen these other platforms kind of, you know, take a new approach where they are adding a lot more sandboxing and then having to to build up new abstractions and protocols to help share information so we don't have to do workarounds like granting everything access to the whole system. But, you know, I do think we should acknowledge those are those are good goals, at least in my opinion, but we haven't finished building that world. We're not all the way in the same place, say, iOS is, and it means that, you know, it can be tricky to get right, and even if it is a safer system for users, doesn't mean that they're still going to be able to do everything that they want to. Yeah, that's a good point, too. It's like you can build a, a system very much like how iOS or Android have built it, but then you also have to have this just complex ecosystem of APIs and ways of accommodating rich application development in such a lockdown system. And we could get there, but it's going to have to be more than XGG portals, right? And I just don't know if we'll actually have the resources to make that a complete usable environment. But at the same time, like, I don't have anything against one particular project or company giving a go at doing this. You know, I let's let Valve have a go and see how it turns out. It's one of the reasons I'm so curious about getting my hands on SteamOS 3 and running it on a PC. What is that like? How long can I survive on a system that's read-only? I'm really curious about that. And I, I want to see them experiment. And I just think that this is just getting to be really uncomfortable for some folks in the community now because... Like, there's users here now on this kind of platform. They want Lutris. And I can totally see where Matthew's coming from. Um, and the uncomfortable fact is, well, these more lockdown devices that run Linux, like the Chrome OS devices, like the Android devices, they, they seem to be wildly popular amongst consumers, right? And we're just sitting here going, but, but it's not really that great. Um, and for some, for, for some customers, it absolutely is. But let them have it, you know, as long as we continue to have choice in the Linux distro ecosystem, I don't think this is going to be a problem. Yeah, we're not yet at a spot where, you know, having switched things to read-write means that the anti-cheat stops working. That would get me concerned, but, you know, just having it write-only to start with, I think we can work with that. And if not, well, you can put whatever Linux distro you want on there. Very true, Wes, and if one thing will always remain a constant, there's always going to be someone out there scratching an itch. So there will always be choice, even for the most niche of niches. And we'll keep an eye on all of them. So why don't you keep an eye on us? Go to linuxactionnews.com slash subscribe for all the ways to get new episodes. And at linuxactionnews.com slash contact if you prefer to use your fingers rather than your eyes. And last call, our East Coast meetup is this weekend as we record. Details at meetup.com slash Jupiter Broadcasting. We'll be back next week with our take on the latest Linux and open source news. Thanks for joining us. And that's all the news for this week. <laughs> <laughs>